Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the NQ podcast. I am super excited for you all to listen to this conversation between myself and Jack Chen, aka KBBQ. He got his start in esports and Dota 2 through work as a Chinese language interpreter at tournaments and sort of snowballed that into some work as an actual talent analyst on desks and as a kind of the inside scoop Chinese liaison with the uh, Chinese teams for the Western audience and has done a lot of work in a variety of capacities in esports. Jack is now currently the manager and sort of uh, mental coach and general team dad for the North American squad Quincy Crew, a professional Dota 2 team that recently qualified for the International 10 and will be playing in Bucharest, Romania. And our conversation really focused a lot on sort of what it is like to be part of a professional team in esports and specifically Dota 2. And one of the interesting things about Jack and his team, Quincy Crew, is that these guys have sort of a core group of players that have been together through several different iterations, and they have previously been part of professional orgs under contract, but currently they do not have a contract with a professional esports organization, and so they are probably going to end up being the only team at the International 10 without sort of official uh, sponsorship, although they probably will have some sponsorship deals for the Quincy Crew brand. And Jack is just incredibly insightful and well-spoken and knowledgeable about all sorts of different parts of the esports industry, and so I think you guys will get a lot out of this conversation, whether you are just a fan of the game uh, or somebody who is looking to learn more about esports or potentially even try to enter the space. So without further ado, let's get into the episode with Jack, aka KBBQ. All right, guys, really excited to bring you this conversation between myself and Jack KBBQ. You might know him as uh, been around the Dota scene for quite some time as I guess you kind of started off as like a uh, translator for the Chinese players at events and have transitioned into talent work as well as managing uh, the Quincy Crew team, which obviously recently won a berth at TI. Very exciting for you guys, I'm sure. Um, and basically, uh, we're going to have a conversation about sort of just like esports, Dota, wherever it kind of leads uh, but Jack, thanks for joining me. How are you today? And I guess, where are you? It kind of looks like you're in outer space, my friend. Pretty good. Uh, I'm in a, a capsule uh, hotel in Kiev. Um, I mean, they, you know, they purposely kind of embraced this sort of marketing aspect of it being like a space capsule. So, you know, I got the, it, it has those vibes. It got some lighting and that, can, that I can change and uh, ventilation and stuff. So it's, it's nice. Um, it's simple, but uh you know that's that's all i really need i don't need a, an apartment or anything i'm i'm you know trying not to be home most of the time and just exploring or whatever and then also i don't have the temptation to play dota because i can't have a, a pc here so it's, it you know serves multiple functions gotcha so if if you can't be grinding dota as as i know you are a, a former huge grinder of the game i think a lot of people in the scene have recognized that uh, what do you do with your your spare time? Um, do you find yourself more productive and doing some like studying or learning about stuff, or or just kind of like exploring the city or what? Yeah, it's um, initially it was more kind of walking around and exploring. And Kiev is a beautiful city. There's so many you know, nice parks and squares and places where you can walk, and it's it's uh it's not like too huge either. So you can you know you can like walk across like half the city center in a fairly uh, decent time. Um, and I mean, since then it's been a little bit less of that, but it's, it's good to, as Schopenhauer would say, it's good to have this sort of, uh, solitude where you are not, you know, just around people or family or, or friends or whatever all the time. And you're kind of just thinking about, you know, like yourself, what you want to do, like the path that you've taken all that. And then you have time, a lot of time to just read and relax. At the same time, it's also very stimulating and interesting for me to learn language. Um, so, you know, I'm not yet taking classes or anything, which I'm considering, but I can learn bits and pieces. I can handle myself now at a, at a restaurant. Um, I just pick, basically just pick a different restaurant every day, go there and then just start my journey there. Um, cool. So, 
it's been it's been nice. Yeah, it's a, I highly recommend. It's a great city, and it's inexpensive as well. So it's nice. Awesome. Um, so is the uh, is the team there with you now, or are they taking a little bit of a hiatus since there's no TI for a few months? Um, everyone's everyone went back home. Okay. Um, I mean, there was one or two players that was considering uh, staying with me as well, but um, ultimately decided not to. And then I originally I wanted to stay because. Um, you know, it was, uh, TI was going to be in Stockholm and I didn't want to go through another set of kind of flights and jet lag adjustments for such a short time. Mm. Um, then obviously, you know, things got, plans got changed and then I had a choice to go back or remain, uh, here. Um, and I, you know, I decided it's, it's nice. Like again, for the last 15 months, um, haven't really had a choice because, because of COVID, right? It's like you just on lockdown and like in home the whole time. So it's nice to just kind of be out somewhere completely different. And also, if I think back on the last three or four years, like I've either been at home or I've been at a team house. Uh -huh. um, I haven't really like had much time to sort of live on my own and just go explore like a brand new place. So there's a certain appeal to doing that. Gotcha. Um, yeah. you're, you're living that sort of like ashram or monastery life for a little bit, I guess. <laughs> kind of like... Getting, kind of more, more of a more of a yeah, hostile totally. so like so the the stereotypical experience is the backpacking through europe which i've which i haven't done so right. this is this is kind of my uh my starting version of that i guess that's awesome um so i uh i wanted to before we hop into sort of like the the deeper topics about management of, of teams and and you know attending ti and that kind of stuff i want to just kind of get a little bit more background on you like how you had sort of a an interesting path to getting into esports was that i mean for for most people that are involved in esports it just kind of happened over time i suppose by having a set of skills and just kind of like applying them and seizing opportunities um but where i guess did your journey begin how do you decide that you want to start sort of like work your way into the esports industry um so i, I kind of didn't i mean i always i played dota like a long time ago and then uh, I think like 2006, 2005, a friend introduced me to it. I played it on and off. It was a great game. Um, there were times when I played it like a lot more, like I said, on and off. And I, I you know, paid some attention to like the scene and like it, it was cool. But it was never really something that I thought would be any sort of like, you know, career path or whatever. Like I, I um, like it, it really was just on the fringes, it was kind of like a passion side project initially like i did some writing i wrote some some articles um i wrote for actually eg way back in the day okay um, you know, um so just stuff like that where i didn't really expect it to go anywhere and at the same time but at the same time it was like again it was like a passion project and i had a background in you know journalism um actually a master's degree so no way. I, I was like i was like this is cool like write about like you know i love love sports i followed sports and played some growing up so i can just kind of put these two together and write some stuff about this game so um but it wasn't something that i was in any way committed to or super hopeful of and then uh, i mean i guess that all changed um in 2015 i think um i, I was asked to go be a translator at uh, esl1 new york and uh and through that process i met some of the people in the scene and uh was, I, I guess they liked. I guess they liked what I what I did. Uh, even though, I mean, <laughs> it's a long story. But my first time on stage was actually there's actually a kind of a disastrous moment there too. So uh, from there, one thing led to another, and uh, you know, other cool opportunities and and chances came, and uh, I just yeah, just tried to make make the most of them and follow the parts of it that I liked, basically. Cool. So even that first uh, that first little opportunity at ESL. Like, did you know somebody that worked at the event or like, how did, how did that even come to be? Cause once, once you're sort of like in the network, you can kind of find opportunities through knowing people, but. Um, I knew somebody who did like uh backend stuff for like, it wasn't for ESL, but he just, he was just involved in like esports. Mm -hmm. And he, I mean, he basically told me, Hey, you speak, you speak Chinese, right. And like, you're, you're big into like games and stuff. Um, this event needs a. Uh, He's a Chinese translator. Uh, wow. You know, okay. Wanna, wanna take it. So it was very fortuitous. And then, you know, there I met, um, I think, Hotbid and some other people. And then after that, Hotbid asked me to go with them to uh, actually shoot the Eternal Envy uh, uh, documentary piece for the upcoming major. 
Um, and so, like I was there to obviously to help like translate and stuff as well with his, within these parents. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that, like that. And after that, it was, it was a Frankfurt uh, major, which was, my, which was my first major. And um, yeah, that's basically how, how it happened. And you know, to be honest, like my, my Chinese was honestly not that great. Um, I had like some exposure to it when I was young, but uh like it wasn't like I grew up in China or you know spent a lot of time speaking other than at home. So I did have to like study a lot and like learn a lot of stuff mm-hmm. um, about the scene and terms and like learn from like other people like you know like Helen like Josh um, like like some people at Val. I had to learn and, and Chinese casters. I had to learn a lot to to kind of get better at that because you know, like I said, my first experience on stage, I was interviewing aggressive and you can you can see a clip of this and. Um, I was so sort of flummoxed and, and unclear with what I said that he didn't understand me at first, even though I asked him a very simple question. Uh-huh. And then he says to the crowd, he says basically like Soma, which is like, what? And then the <laughs> crowd was like laughing. So to me, I was like, damn, I, I really, I really botched it. All right, uh-huh. right. But then, but then I kind of just was like, okay, that's the worst thing that could happen. You know, like that wasn't so bad. I'm still here. <laughs> Let's just keep sure. going. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it started. And you know, that's, that's how it grew, I guess. Awesome. Okay. So, so from there you, um, I mean, obviously you are a, a very personable guy. And so once you're kind of like meeting people and getting more and more opportunities, uh, it makes a lot of sense that you would start to kind of like transition into this talent role and, and you have a very unique niche of being able to kind of bring, and it's funny that you mentioned that you your Chinese was not super good at the beginning and you had to kind of like do a lot of studying and, and learning from the Chinese personalities and to to kind of like get the slang down, I'm sure. Um, different Dota terms probably are, are way different. And you kind of became almost known for that uh, in the scene, right? Bringing like the Chinese memes and, and sort of like the inside little jokes between the players and stuff like that. Um, so what was that like of, of becoming more of like an in-person or more forward-facing person in, in the scene? Like, was that something that you look forward to or was that sort of a whole new set of challenges and, and maybe like nervous moments to, <laughs> to get there? It was, it was a whole new set of challenges. Um, I never really had much experience as a public speaker. Mm-hmm. Like the last time, I mean, I, I wasn't speaking, I was just interpreting, but, I, but like the last time I you know, had a microphone in front of a bunch of people was like probably when I was running for like class president in seventh <laughs> grade or something. Right. So sure. I'd never really like embraced that part. So it was, it was a challenge, obviously just being nervous. And then the fact that instead of kind of speaking freely, you have to like, you know, you have to hear what the person says, understand it and then present it in a, in a good way. Um, so it was it was definitely a challenge because again my my Chinese is not that good. Um, it definitely not on the level of Helen or Josh, um, my my I guess predecessors and mentors in a way. Um, so it took it did take a lot of work. Like I just had to look some things up. I had to learn from them. I had to just find whatever I could, um, you know. And then I and then my sort of regular Chinese, like conversational Chinese, also had to catch up a bit, which you know happened through interactions with more of the players and, and stuff like that. So it, it took a lot of work and there were a number of times where things like, you know, didn't go so well. I remember at Frankfurt, um, uh, old chicken repeated some meme of like Chinese Dota is dead, but I thought he was speaking English because of the way he said it. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, if I had recognized and known the meme, like uh, immediately, like I would have known what it was. Um, so it was clear that there are moments where, you know, stuff had to catch up and I still had to get better at it. But um, I've always enjoyed language. Um, I, I find a lot of the memes and stuff is fascinating because in, in Chinese, they have these um, basically sayings and phrases. They're called Chengyu. They're basically ancient memes that go back thousands of years. Like That's basically <laughs> what they are. Um, okay. So language is, is very given to this sort of artful expression. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and uh, in addition to that, I, I love like this – sort of like fiend fiend and fiendy stuff so you know when it came to nicknames that people have for players or you know kind of maybe rumors or whatever or like you know you know like on forums there's like different layers of fans right there's like Mm -hmm. the the kind of like very like broad you know like like fans come in when when they're like happy but then there's like there's like a there's like a a sub zone where people are like super savage and like you know i mean so like 
the, the, the Chinese scene also has sort of different forums and layers like that. And they come up with some really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's such wordsmiths and there's so many of them. It, it, it's great. So it, it, it was really interesting to me to kind of get into that and learn what those things meant and find out all the nicknames. And it, it was, it was, it was great. I loved it. Uh, during that stretch, it was, it was just very natural and very fun. Every time I learned something like, you know, I just couldn't wait to, to share it with, with the world uh, at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. And so that culminated with you actually working as like a, a member of the talent at TI, right? That was TI seven, was it? Was uh, that, yeah, that, I think that? so. Before then, for for TI six, I mean, I was there as a translator. So I actually at TI six, I translated the uh, the loser interviews with the Chinese teams. Oh, okay. And uh, I think they ended up, I think they ended up not airing them because like. Some were like pretty awkward or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's the only on camera stuff that I did. So, um, the other stuff, I guess, as a translator, you're, you know, obviously you're working with teams. You're like, you might be doing like subtitles and stuff like that. You might be helping just to smooth things out with like different production. So, you learn, you get to you get exposed a bit to sort of the production process and, you know, the casters and stuff like that. So, it was a lot of stuff to learn and figure out for the first time. It was cool. Um, yeah, TI7 was the first time that I was really. Well, I guess uh, so. At TI seven, um, uh, someone someone at Valve, I, I don't I don't I don't name name people. Sure. Uh, you know, just had a, uh, gave me a really unique opportunity um, to kind of just have this little corner where I talk about like Chinese stuff, mm -hmm. and um, I guess it turned out pretty well because I guess people liked it. Um, you know, and I got to share some of those spicy uh, memes and stuff. But also, um, yeah, one of those nice. The, Chinese caster jackets too, right? Like they, they kind of like yeah. welcomed you in the fold a little bit. So, so, so part of the reason I got that, I think is because there were some, some Chinese casters had visa issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually ended up kind of being put on emergency duty as like the host of the group stage in Chinese. Oh wow. Um, because my Chinese is, is not, you know, it's not good enough to be a caster. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, well, we're shorthanded. What can we do? And maybe this guy can can go out there and and you know try to host the the, the group stage panel or whatever. So it, that that was you know initially pretty terrifying and you know I I, I did my best is all I could say. But it, but um, yeah. So I guess I guess that plus like the summits. Um, mm. I want to thank obviously like both David Scorman and Parker and the BTS uh, family and crew for giving me some of those opportunities to go on the couch with the Chinese players and, and all that. So. Um, yeah, those were probably the real, the first real sort of talent opportunities. And then, uh, you know, I was asked to panel at some other events and stuff like that as well. Awesome. Well, I mean, that's kind of just like a, a whirlwind journey, I guess, over the just like, like a two or three year period. Um, but that seems to be how a lot of the, the esports journeys work. Um, through through all those interactions with the teams, is that kind of where your interest in starting to like work as more of like a team liaison or manager is that where that kind of came from or is that more of like you mentioned sports is that more of like a sporting background as something that you're like hey i, I bet i could probably bring some interesting um things to esports and, and team environment look at you man you're figuring out the puzzle um <laughs> yeah so the the team side was always something that was kind of both appealing and unknown to me um so one like you know, there were times when, like, I tried to see, hey, how good of a Dota player can I be? I'm really competitive. I love this game. Obviously, nowhere near good enough. Um, but I was always curious sort of about the dynamics inside a team, like how they actually thought about the game, things they paid attention to. Um, and then, again, from my own experiences growing up, like, again, playing team sports, um, you know, like like competing on, on some level and, and some of them, and then just just – always following sports and stuff i was really interested in again like the team side of it and if you know if there's some way that i could also help in some ways either build or improve or um you know even even like find the right group of people like th there's always something there where there's a calling of like not just the team side but like the ultimate accomplishment in this game is to win the ti right is to win it win a championship in any, in any game the highest level of competition so there is something about that that uh that called to me and that was missing from i guess from from the talent side um mm -hmm. and so i wanted to be a part of that process uh and you know when when that opportunity came uh from from uh, jeremy lynn and and uh and his uh 
his group that, that were you know, trying to do that. Uh, I, you know, I was, it, that, Hey, there's Jeremy Lin, one of my, you know, yeah, let's go <laughs> say, I, idols in some way. Yeah. And then, uh, here's, here's a chance to sort of be a part of like you know, working with, and in some ways, like, uh, starting a team, like, yeah, that sounds, sign me up. That sounds great. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was not an easy decision. I feel like, you know, I feel like the, the talent path was like just starting to kind of bear fruit and work out. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like you, you got to follow the things that, that, uh, that call to you. Right. Um, 100%. And then and that's the, the, the other part about that is I think the other side of the talent thing is it's not easy to, to talk about or share, but it's like you, it's hard to get like constant sort of feedback and improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to kind of like continue to like grow, I would say, or like really improve or climb once you've like sort of proven yourself. Um, and, and then like, there's always all this uncertainty and there's a lot of politics, obviously sometimes with like organizers and stuff like that. Yep. Um, and then if you go to all the events, uh, like some of the casters do, you know, it, it can feel like the, someone a senior caster described it to me is it's like the circus it's like you're in a different uh hotel a different arena every two weeks right but you don't you don't like necessarily get to go out and like sport you don't get like time to yourself really even to like maybe even watch or play as much dota as you'd like you're kind of just in this in this like autopilot mode mm-hmm. um so so there was a part of that where i just felt like I'd grown so much even getting to that point, but I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to be growing that much in ways that I liked afterwards uh, to, to keep doing that. Um, yeah, that makes so much sense. I mean, it I, was, mean, yeah, I, it I was haven't either done, a choice of like, yeah, right. go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't done like a ton of the, the, talent side stuff, but I have, you know, I've done a bunch of online stuff and I have been to a couple of, of smaller lands and uh, I mean, just everything that you mentioned is, is really it's really real, like the the politics side and and the side of just y- people don't really realize from watching the outside. I think that the casting team and like the talent team, they really are in like a bubble of of just like work. There is nothing else. Like you you work a twelve hour day. You're so exhausted. Your brain is just like completely fried. You go to sleep. You wake up. You do it again. And most of the time your flight comes in a few days before the event starts and leaves a few days after it starts. And you're basically just like, like you said, it's almost like a circus. You go, you put on a show and then you leave and there's nothing else outside of that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's parts of it obviously that I enjoyed that that I still miss a lot of, you know, like just being around some of those people is great. It's always Mm -hmm. a fun time being around most of them. Um, But then there's also a, a sort of sense of fulfillment or calling if you will, that, that I felt was kind of missing. And I had a choice. It was either try to grow by becoming more of a general sort of host. Cause I, I enjoyed the few times I got to do that, even though it was in Chinese um, or, you know, or go to go to the team side. And again, the team side had always been this, like this big unknown to me because mm-hmm. in the scene, at least like casters and, and, and don't really talk that much to, to teams and players, I mean, players and teams don't really talk that much to casters, generally speaking, unless they're like former pros or something. So it was, it was something that the veil was being lifted on that as well, which was just very intriguing for me. Totally. Yeah. I got a chance to, um, to coach a, a EU stack or a couple different iterations of an EU stack, uh, over the last two DPCs, um, and qualifying for them. And even that, that was like the only real experience I've had with, working with like pro or semi-pro players. And it really is an interesting environment and, and just like completely different than uh, you might expect. And also fairly similar to some things that you might <laughs> expect out of, out of pro Dota players. So I can totally understand that, that drive to want to go do that. And of course competing, did you have a favorite sport growing up? What, what was your, your sport of choice? Um, um so it, it was overwhelmingly basketball. Okay. Um, I mean, I was on the football team for a year in high school, but that was, you know, I, I watched that, I would say more like college football and stuff, but like I also got injured and that wasn't, you know, that wasn't, uh, that was much harder to, to, to play that for sort of different reasons. Um, but basketball, I always played, like I played as a kid. Um, like, uh, I, I, uh, you know, competed in these sort of like, uh, these leagues and stuff. Um, so 
basketball was always something that I loved and, and still do. Like you can, you can ask my players, but you know, we're always talking about like basketball stuff. And I even at some point, uh, you know, showed them like some of the, some of my, some like old footage from some like rec league that I played in. Cause someone was like recording the games. Uh-huh. So they got a real kick out of that. Um, awesome. Stuff like that. So yeah, th- those were the two main things. And beyond that, it's just reading about, um, beyond the surface level reading about not just the, the sort of strategy or whatever of the game, but like the psychology behind it, right? Like how, how, how the players prepare, how you deal with different team dynamics. Um, and then sort of experiencing some of that too. Like uh, there were people, they're close friends I grew up playing with. And, you know, there's like, even like, I don't want to be too specific, but there's some examples from those interactions that I shared with my players that made sense to them. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, this guy might've been better, than us and he knew it but he he tried to motivate us and lift us in a way that might have caused resentment instead right and mm-hmm. like these 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 are types of things that i've like talked about and they resonate with uh, with players on some level as well um you know how to get the most out of your teammates and uh, obviously out of yourself as well awesome yeah i uh it's, it's funny you mentioned basketball i uh, recently listened to a book by chris bosch um, and you know, he had sort of like an untimely exit from, from professional basketball for health reasons. Uh, but he, he wrote a book called, I think it's called letters to a young athlete. I think that's the title. And it's basically just like him writing letters to himself when he was a kid about the things that you're going to have to go through if you want to make it, uh, in the league or, or just, you know, succeed in life. And, you know, there's, there's parts like motivational speaking kind of, general tropes but there's also some really cool stuff about him you know explaining dealing with certain situations with him and lebron and wade and ray allen and like the people that he learned from in the league and that kind of stuff so i found it super fascinating as a sports fan um and okay that's 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 on my list i've always been a lebron fan i know i know chris bosh has his reputation for being like a very thoughtful mm -hmm. like very like right like he he wasn't even like in medical school or something and obviously he had like blood clots and and all that when and he's like kind of this forgotten unsung like super glue guy cog of those heat championship teams so yeah i'll i'll I'll, uh i'll hit you up afterwards i'll look into that that's that's something that i gotta put on a reading list yeah, and and he reads the audiobook himself. So that's I mean, I'm always a big fan of that when the when the author actually like reads their own work to you. So it's just kind of cool uh to hear his thoughts from him. Um so let's let's get a little bit deeper into where you are now in Dota with your the manager of Quincy Crew, um the sort of I guess now there's two unsigned teams at TI, but you guys have sort of been like that one really steady professional dota team that doesn't really have org backing over the last i mean realistically it's been almost like two years at this point because there's been a few different iterations um you guys this current roster minus uh i guess it's for it used to be you you formed it with sumail and then obviously that didn't work out for whatever reason now you have lelis as your sort of final piece to the puzzle but this roster in general came together back in 2019 in september um and you guys have you signed with chaos at one point and i guess certain iterations were with forward gaming and and so you've kind of run the gauntlet i suppose of a professional dota while navigating a variety of different problems um and still come out on top i mean you guys have been such a steady rock of competition both in na and as well as international um, so I guess just tell me a little bit about Quincy crew and, and sort of that journey, you don't have to be too specific, but kind of where are you, where are you guys now as a team? Sure. I mean, so the origin goes back a little bit further than that. So the name, um, as well comes from Quincy street, which is where we had our team house, um, at VUJ storm. And that's mm, when, okay. that's when first came together with, um, SVG and Yawar and Mojo who are obviously still on the team today. And right. back then it was snaking and, uh, Tomato, and then initially, and because Tomato had some like visa difficulties at the time, I think he was like getting his citizenship or something, so he couldn't come to the boot camp for a bit. We ended up, uh, you know, getting somebody else, which is Rezo. Um, that's right. So that's where the name Quincy Crew came from. Came from because uh, the, the place that we stayed, like, you know, let's just say it wasn't the most luxurious uh, place. It was okay, but it wasn't the most luxurious place. And so there's a certain uh, sort of you know, we're, we're in the heart of Brooklyn and there's a certain, uh, you know, 
sort of ethos and environment and atmosphere that we that that helped us, I think, and that we enjoyed and took some pride in. And so, mm-hmm. whenever we were unsponsored as a stack, I just you know, decided, hey, like, what do you guys think about Quincy Crew? And then so we decided to just go with that. Um, and then we considered changing at some points, but I I fought pretty hard to keep it because I was like. You know, I don't want to be, become one of these stacks that just changes their name like every other qualifier. Like, right. let's let's you know, I, we weren't thinking too far ahead of the time, but I was like, Let, let's stick with this. Like, this is us. You know, this is still us. Um, Some sort of branding so, at the very least, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I just think it's a nice, simple name, and it just you know just made sense, mm. um, and it, it gives us a sense of identity. Um, so yeah, like we've we've worked with a lot of sort of different orgs and with different dynamics that come in, um, you know, some orgs, uh, the, the ownership or, you know, management wants to, it, it becomes like a, like a trifecta, a triumvirate, if you will. Right. There's like management ownership and the players. Mm-hmm. Um, it becomes a difficult relationship to balance at times because, you know, sometimes the ownership wants like a hand in, in certain things, which makes sense. And then, you know, that maybe the players want something different. Maybe, maybe management feels something different is, is better. And so you, you have to balance these sort of relationships. And we navigated that across different teams with different situations and dynamics. Um, and then um, Avery retired. Um, mm-hmm. you know, our team basically imploded in, in uh, at the uh, Stockholm Major in uh, March of uh, 2019. Avery retired. Um, and then, you know, that's when, that's when we brought Quinn in and then, you know, we went to the next TI. I mean, it, it just, that's when like this, the four uh, people on this team sort of came together. Um, mm-hmm. once Avery came back out of retirement, right. um, the following, after that TI. So yeah, that ended up kind of cementing itself into, into a group. We had some real ups and downs. I mean, you know, you mentioned like consistency and stuff. We also consistently didn't do that well at uh, majors and, and big competitions. Um, so that was some consistency that we wanted to get rid of. And we, we just kind of always felt that there was like a missing piece that it was like kind of hard to, uh, you know, find this like offlane player that, that fit us like ethos wise and personality wise. And, you know, like snaking did a lot of really good things. And you know, I love that guy. Um, mm. You know, I, I hang out with him like, you know, even, even like a, when there's like breaks in the season and stuff like he's always been my friend. Um, but uh, we, we wanted somebody that, that fits certain other characteristics and traits. And so we went through a couple uh, trial members, including Saberlight, um, mm-hmm. who's now a TI, including DM, who's now a TI with VP. And then, uh, you know, ultimately we also tried to do a position switch. Um, and said, we're like, why, why don't we just try to fill that role from within? Cause Mojo has experience, but none of those things uh, sort of, worked out that great. We had a period of some success with Biver, but then Biver kind of really became, uh, it was hard for him to sort of keep playing like, you know, from so far away through like right. the dark period of COVID. Um, so yeah, ult- ultimately like, you know, Lelis is available. He, he speaks English because he, uh, was, was born and grew up a little bit in America. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's like a pretty, pretty good fit. He had some experience before as a captain and he's a skilled player. Um, so, yeah, that's how we sort of got to the configuration that we're at today. And uh, I know that's sort of the bare bones sketch of the journey, but you know, if I were to go into every piece has its own, you know, I'm details. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure the story really just kind of branches with each individual player and, and move and roster update and revision and that kind of stuff. I mean, I'll be honest, like when I was coaching this European team, we changed our roster five different times in like six months and it's just that's just kind of how it works like you're trying to find the right pieces that fit and you mentioned some really important stuff just like the general vision of the team is really important and having everybody kind of buy into the same idea is that something that you kind of have played a part in developing or is that more of like the players coming up with how they want to think about the game and play is that like a svg specific as the captain um, where does where does sort of like team identity come from, and and how did you guys develop that? Um, I, I think it's I mean it's mostly the players. It's it's got to start with the captain. So SVG's got a big part in that, and then also Quinn has also played a huge role in that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in terms of having like very strong ideas, conviction, and then like trying to get people to kind of execute and be on the same page. Like uh, I would say, those two are some of the main driving forces of that. Um, I would say my role in this sort of thing has been. 
uh, and it, I haven't always been successful with it. You know, I've made plenty of mistakes over the years, but to try to try to help instill, obviously like to, to back up the captain, but also to try to help instill this, this ethos um, of like, Hey, take yourself seriously. Like your elite competitors and athletes, like, you know, let's mm. keep trying to build better habits. Let's keep trying to make like, you know, better decisions. Let's keep trying to, to act it like act like a responsible team. Um, you know, let's, let's, let's not take things for granted or, or become, you know, spoiled or cocky or anything. Let's try to like embrace some of the, the grindier, harder aspects of stuff. Cause that's, that's what it takes at the highest levels of competition. Eventually you have to be able to do that to stand out and excel. Um, so now whether it's that or sort of, you know, I, I want to, I, I want our team to, to communicate well. I want our team to, to be free of it and to have a good culture, a good team culture. Those are things that uh, I've, looked a lot into and sort of tried to, you know, instill, I want our team to be always seeking improvement, trying to, trying to, you know, learn and read more, trying to like improve themselves outside the games. I think it gives you energy in the game. You don't want to just be too focused on too, you know, tunnel visioned on just one thing. Um, So those are the sorts of things that, that I've uh, been, been focused on for the most part with the team. Awesome. I mean, huge respect to that. That's something that I, initially like drew me to esports is that i saw that that was missing and i was like how how can i bring some of this stuff that i've learned through i mean because i've been playing sports since i was like four i've you know been under a coach at some point in my year (laughs) every year uh basically all the way through college and i i feel like that's the one thing that's really really truly missing from esports professionals in a lot of cases is that because they don't grow up in that team structure or with like real mentors they just have kind of been almost like stumbled into the spotlight by being super good at a, at a hobby that is now a, a competitive global phenomenon um, they missed out developing a very specific set of skills that makes them coachable and good at interacting with other people so i can understand like how much work it takes to develop that especially probably in a short amount of time with people that have strong convictions about things and are very good at what they do where it's like you know i'm already this good why do i need help getting better and and that's that's definitely a tough thing to kind of like discuss and and make people understand i would imagine especially i mean you you mentioned you you mentioned something that was literally in an exact conversation that i've had you know with avery and stuff it's like uh if, if in a in a structured more traditional sport by the time you get to the, that level you've been part of teams and you've been coached and you've been you know, you've had to experience all these things and there's a lot more structure and culture to it and you know esports is still off in the wild west so some of those things are, are missing they're also harder to uh, potentially instill in people and there's there's so many there's other forces going on too like you know, too much too soon is a big thing in traditional sports, right? Because you have some teenager that's suddenly getting all this attention, all this fame, all this, mm-hmm. and it's kind of hard to, to keep their head in the right place and stay focused and, you know, remember like what got them there and all that. Um, so these are all things that esports uh, competitors deal with. And um, again, it's been, it's been fascinating. It's been stuff I've always been super interested in and uh, you know, to varying degrees, depending on the coach, um, it, you know, we've tried to sort of instill and improve that. And again, all, a lot of the credit like ha- has to go to the captain and, mm-hmm. and it, it starts there. Right. Cause like if he, if he's not about that, um, if he's not about like helping to establish a good culture and, and, and all that, and then, you know, wh- wh- what can you do? Um, I'm not a coach, I'm a manager and I have a unique relationship with a lot of players, you know, a unique amount of like trust and stuff that goes into it. But at the end of the day, the captain's got to be, got to be spot on with it and uh avery is yeah i uh i actually i think the very first thing i ever did in esports um was i i did an article so i went to ti6 with uh liquipedia to do some of their like their forum articles covering the event and my first sort of like op-ed piece personal project that i did for them was I think it was titled like the meta of the coach or something like that. And I got, I interviewed specifically coaches at TI and, and SVG was one of the ones that I interviewed. And I just remember our conversation um, being really like, I, I clearly understood that this, this guy gets it more than most people. And, and like, I think I interviewed him and Seb and 
couple other people, but I just very specifically remember him and, and Seb in particular being the two people that were like, I was like, oh, they understand this more from the perspective of like a true leader outside of whatever gaming context we're in and sort of like understanding how to actually develop talent and get people to buy in um, to your ideas. And um, that that level of communication is is really what makes a team good beyond anything else is like having people who actually communicate and understand each other working together towards a common goal. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's hard. It's imperfect. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's never like you, you, you might always say afterwards if you won or whatever. Yeah. But it's, it's never perfect. And so it's always a never ending struggle. Uh, mm. um, but you know, as, as like, as a leader, you, if you, you, you can't shy away from it. Right. So you have to enjoy it and, and, uh, or, you know, be interested in and try, try to make it better and be willing to fight the, the battles all the time. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it's very valuable. And you're seeing now, I think, more than ever, there's like, especially at TI, there's so much pressure and so much, so much stakes. And I think that's where things like this mental toughness and team culture, that's, that's where that stuff really does a lot of work because mm -hmm. you need people to be able to look to each other, back each other up when, when the pressure and stakes are the highest. You don't, you can't have people who, you know, if you struggle and, and you will get hit in the face at TI, um, as you start pointing fingers or you start looking inwards, or whatever you, so that stuff I think to me is like super important. And uh, yeah, it starts, it starts with people in positions of authority and leadership on the team to different degrees, but I think the responsibility has to be accepted to, to, to try and get people to that point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of wanted to return to a point you mentioned earlier, just in regards to this topic, which is you were saying that this team has sort of um, historically struggled a bit at lands. Um, do you think that that is like a, is that just a mixture of inexperience or do you, where do you think that that kind of stems from? Cause it is a bit of a pattern, but I also know that your team is capable of like really incredible Dota. Like they're extremely skilled and you seem to also be able to show plenty of flashes of brilliance. So like where, where is that line where it just like seems to be dominance up until the point where it's like that one moment that could push you into the upper echelon where it just seems to fall short. I mean, a lot of times it feels like we're one game away, right? There, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's some inconsistency. I think, yeah, their inexperience is a part of it. I think also if you look um, if you look at TI, like we've made upper bracket the last two TIs, which means that you're, you know, we even won our group at TI8, right? So, you, so you're at minimum, like you have the skill to like be a pretty good team. Yeah. Um, then, But then it all has to come together under the highest pressure. I think that's something we need to get better at. Um, I mean, the other stuff, like, the majors and stuff. Um, I mean, over the years, it's it's there are some things that like do matter here and there. Like for one, um, you know, every single major is in Europe or Asia, right? Um, and and what that usually means is, you know, you go there and you have to play pretty meaningful games fairly quickly when you're still like pretty tired and jet lagged because nobody really boot camps that much for majors, right? Mm. Um, so I don't think it's always a huge thing because there are teams that do well in spite of that, but I think it, it doesn't help. And if you're coming down to these, you know, series where you're like one game away or half a game away or you, whatever, like that stuff could easily make some amount of difference. Like even five, 10% difference is pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that kind of maybe helps explain why we've done better compared to the field at TI where you have all this time to adjust and prepare and you're playing a very wide field of teams, right? Right. Um, so that proves that, like, yeah, again, like we have the skill and the ability to be there, I think. But it all has to come together. We have to be consistent. We have to uh, be able to, to fall back on each other when, when you know, there are problems or when we lose. Um, learning how to, something that's been said, but like learning how to handle losses, learning how to compartmentalize, learning how to move on. Um, well, these are all things that we can get better at. And uh, it's all, you know, some, some people in the scene, like they had to, lose for five or 10 years before totally. they experience their first major success. Right. And it's hard. It's always hard to think about this sort of long-term thing when you have so many question marks about the scene. Um, but you know, like they, they took their lumps and, and they stuck with it and they took lessons from it and they improved. And, you know, now some of them are, are a lot more 
successful. They've, they've been in the mix long enough to know. So yeah, yeah there's elements of, uh, of all of that. And then otherwise, I think you, you do start to see some regional differences over time in terms of what teams do well in certain regions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, like we, we don't get this, we don't have the same sort of constant scrim practice on certain things that maybe a China does or maybe a Europe does. So, so those things can matter. Like it can matter based on, you know, at least partly based on the patch, based on hero pools. Those are sort of just unknown variables that can always play a factor. So it's yeah. a, it's a very complicated mix of things uh, that determines. And then finally, just the, just the mental state of, of, of the team. Um, is everybody healthy? Is everybody on the same page? Are people, you know, like, is everyone like ready to go? Or are people thinking about or worry about are people distracted or worry about other things? It's, it's all a bunch of moving pieces that have to be figured out. Well, Jack, you're doing my job for me because you're transitioning me to the next topic that I want to talk about, which is sort of the, the business side of, of being a team and as an unsponsored team, I would imagine that there is a little bit of maybe extra pressure because you don't have sort of like a, maybe a stable backbone all the time where it's like, if you lose, I mean, that's your income, right? Like you get your tournament winnings and then that's essentially it. Um, how, how is that sort of like colored the, um, the team? in terms of like their mood and the way that they interact with the game at all. Um, and, and I guess like, what, what is it like to be an unsponsored team in professional Dota? I, I would imagine it's, it's quite the ride. Um, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's hard because there's no, there's no security, right? There's mm -hmm. no, and then like you, it's all in on like TI basically. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard. The other aspect of it is, you know, we, North America has the smallest fan base. Um, and most of them I would say are probably EG fans. Mm -hmm. Um, so people tune this out to varying degrees and they pay attention to the varying degrees, but you know, you go out there and everyone just thinks that you suck. Everyone's like hoping that you lose or they take an aim at you, uh, for stuff that, you know, sometimes it's just downright hypocritical. Like they're talking about how unstable like NA is, but there's these other regions that the top shuffle team shuffle constantly. people yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yeah, um, or, you know, like their team doesn't make it and they start taking aim at you and why you don't deserve it. it that stuff, you know, that stuff gets to people and you don't have this, the same sort of support. You don't, you don't have this sort of, yeah, like you said, like backing. Um, and you and everyone thinks that you're bad, and so you know you can you can develop a chip on your shoulder and stuff. Uh, it it should to some extent be able to help build character and help people to like focus on what they're doing this for, right? Like you're doing this to be the best, and you're doing this for TI. Like it's just pure and simple now. You're you're at the purest level of a Dota team. You're a team of five players, um, you know, trying to trying to be the best, trying to beat people. And you have to prove yourself every time you know that those stakes are there and you know that you're not going to have this fallback if you don't prove yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's both. I mean, in some ways it's a blessing in disguise and it just, you know, it has to put a fire under people. Like you either, you either step away and you quit or like you go all in with this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is, it is definitely tough at times just because you don't have support for things. Uh, you're not, you're not boot camping when other people boot camping. You're not together as a team, like developing and playing stuff, and you know, developing like synergy and stuff, and and things that you can do in person. Um, your your travel and other issues are more exacerbated without someone to back it up. Um, you know, you're not you're not being paid for. Right. Like you have to win a tournament to get a you have to win every tournament every month to have a livable wage uh, in this game, and then so you're constantly thinking, should I? is it worth it? Should I keep playing this? What's going to happen in the future? Do I take this offer from somebody else? That seems pretty good. That's happened multiple times to our guys. Um, you know, did, did I make the right decision? Like if you lose, did I make the right decision? Like, should I be like, you know, these, these are all sort of sources of doubt and uncertainty that can creep in. And I think on the one end, too much comfort and, you know, can breed indifference and complacency. That's not good. Sure. But on the other hand, if you're just you know, sort of in the wilderness and you're like, hey, you know, we're like, we might be the best team in the Western Hemisphere, or, and certainly one of the best best teams in the Western Hemisphere, and you're telling me this is not worth something anymore to like anybody or almost anything, mm -hmm. um, you know, like that's 
that's pretty deflating, right? So it's tough. Yeah, man. I mean, it's a whole nother layer of pressure. It's like every game actually is for money, whereas most people, I mean, it, and realistically, that is how it always is. But I would imagine that it's just kind of like there is that extra thing in the back of everybody's mind where, you know, if you don't win, you don't eat. Not necessarily. I'm sure that all of you guys, you guys have probably uh, won enough. And I'm sure that most of them probably have decent family structures and stuff like that, where it's not like they're literally homeless if they don't win. But the dream significantly suffers if you, if you don't have success. And so that um, it's actually pretty remarkable that they have handled that. And then, like you said, having to go to other countries most of the time to play and like the scrim partners are maybe fewer and farther between in terms of skill. It, it's actually incredibly impressive that you guys have come as far as you have in, in a fairly short period of time. Um, and, and speaking of the, the sort of like the backbone or the backing of a team, you came out fairly recently and announced that Quincy crew is going to TI as Quincy crew. You're not, you're not in search of an org, which I mean, that was a thing a couple of years ago and and for the the vast majority of dota team qualifies for a ti they get picked up by an org that wants exposure um and it i'm sure it gives the team a boot camp and and maybe some extra you know travel arrangements and that kind of stuff but realistically valve invites the players they invite like the team outside of the org and so it is really about the players so that's kind of a, an interesting decision and and kind of an admirable one in my opinion uh just because it really isn't about the org at the end of the day when it comes to TI. Yeah, um, I do want to clear up what that means. Um, you know, we have a we signed a merch deal that should be announced pretty soon. Like we are in talks with like different sort of sponsors. It's just we're not going to go just be part of somebody else's org and just right. be their mercenary for TI. Um, so, um, yeah, it it it's it uh, we came too far just as Quincy crew and it, uh, you know, when we talked after the major and stuff, like there's a meeting and, and, uh, or individual discussions and like the name, you know, it means something to us. Like, again, at some point during those really like much darker times, that's all we had. <laughs> we just had the name and we just have the stack. Right. So right. there's an, there's an emotional component to it. Um, of like difficulty of buy-in of, of, of sacrifice of, uh, art shared hardship that, uh, some value there and so we we weren't we you know we'd be willing to to have left some pretty intriguing or interesting offers on the table which we did because that was just that was just kind of a non-starter um and yeah that we decided to do that as a group and um it has been interesting i guess from a business point of view because ti is valuable and mm. uh, you know there is there is still a decent amount of sponsorship interest there was two years ago uh when we Went to end up going to newbie and there is there is now it's not the same thing but you know of course ti is valuable um so mm -hmm. it's it's been interesting to sort of navigate that it's taken a, a good amount of time and stuff as well but you know it's it's nice to to kind of feel also a sense of like validation you know finally like like for the for the, for the time that the team has put in and uh, you know just just to, like to reward people for uh, at least on some level for like their efforts and their time. Um, yeah, yeah it's been, I've, I've seen those, uh, those sick jackets that you have. Those are, those are legit. I like the, uh, the ones that you wore at the, the animator. Those are uh, kind of reminiscent of like the, uh, the Chinese team jacket, which is um, just very, it gives it like a little bit of extra professionalism, which is something that you said you definitely value um, in terms of the team. Um, does most of that business sort of like negotiating with sponsors, is that like your realm and you just let the players play and, and you sort of handle all of that, all of those talks and then maybe bring them sort of what the options are? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I handle that. Um, we do have people helping us out with like, um, shout out to, to, to them, uh, who help us out with like some social media and, um, you know, like we released a video today that was like a recap, a uh, slappy bag, uh, mm -hmm. Made that video for a slappy bag nine check them out on youtube and uh, so we have, do have some very talented and sort of you know passion project people helping us out and like you know making logo and helping make assets stuff like that um so 
Yeah, it's not it's not just me, but for the for the decisions, I guess the the, the negotiations and stuff is, is me. And then beyond that, like like I've explained to you, you know, I, I would say in some ways an amateur sports psychologist on some fronts, and then mm-hmm. also a, a a big brother, I would say, a big brother um, when 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 it's needed or when it's justified. That's awesome, man. Uh, I I'm like uh, I don't know. Consider me a new Quincy Cruz stan. I, I feel like having this extra context is, is so good for me looking at TI coming up. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just respect the whole the whole game of playing the game and, and making it this far. Uh, tell me a little bit about, just like briefly, your thoughts on the DPC circuit. Because I know this has been a fairly debated and controversial change to the game. Um, and probably for you guys maybe not a positive one just because it's a very locked in schedule and something that kind of rewards orgs more so because you can like say hey we're gonna you know play x amount of hours on stream so here's the the data for our sponsorship deals and that kind of stuff um how how's the dpc circuit been for for quinta crew um some things about it were better than i thought um I think that just the, the consistency and the structure, how it's helped out TOs and talent, I think that's good. It's added some layers of stability, things that were extremely volatile. I think that's a plus. Um, I think from a team point of view, one of the main things is we just we just don't get to play that much. Mm-hmm. Like, like knowing that you're guaranteed to play EG twice a year, I, I don't know if that's like a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. like I think like I feel like it could be better in terms of like viewership and stuff. Um, right. I think that's that's one of the main things that I still think could be improved. Although you don't want to overdo it, obviously you don't want to play too much because then it devalues the games and it tires people out, of course. But I think two is like too little. Um, I think. I mean, I came out with a series of complaints when it was first released because I, you know, I thought about it together with SVG and there's some things that we were really concerned about. Some of them have proven thankfully like untrue or myopic perhaps um the other thing i think is the, the format for the majors is just it's it's just got to be better i yeah. think i think there's just i don't understand there's no good reason why you can't <laughs> why you can't have well no no it's fine to it might be okay to have 10 of 18 teams go home empty-handed but you have to have a consistent format i think you just need mm. to have people play as many different teams as possible um my suggestion for format would be, again, just have as much round robin out of big groups as possible. You can even shorten the main tournament potentially to like single elim or something if you have to save on like time or resources because the main thing is the teams playing each other to see who's good on an international level for TI, right? Right, the so intermixing you can even have this of the thing where, Yeah, you can even have this thing where you're playing um, sort of round robin and you're giving teams points per win. Mm-hmm. You know, like some DPC points per win, and then you have a single Elim tournament, or whatever, to finish it off. Like that's fine because the tournament itself, the way it's structured now, it's not, it's, it's worth very little compared to TI. Mm-hmm. Um, so then it's not necessarily about the finish of the tournament, who wins. It's about how good are teams compared to other teams in the national field, and that's what the, the the tournament should be structured towards. If that's what it is, if it's just a global uh, land TI qualifier, then address it accordingly. Either that or you go back to you know old formats where you have like a major that's actually worth like a lot of money and stands alone as its own tournament that teams can focus on. I mean, I think most people would prefer that, but it's it's hard to do and it right. takes it takes a lot. Um so yeah, if, if it's if we're gonna continue to be in this direction where TI grows more and more, becomes disproportionately larger part of the scene, then you know, have the major formats be more consistent and, and have less variance and be more reliable. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because right now, like technically, you could just go up against a region that has a totally different take on the meta that counters yours twice and then you're done and you don't really get to actually show that you were good against, you know, CIS and China and SEA, but you just, I don't know, lost to North America twice or you just lost to South America or whatever. Um, and that's, like you said, it is very high variance considering how important it is to actually like determining what the scene looks like. I mean, we really, I think this is probably the first year in the last maybe three years or so where I really don't feel super confident that the best 
all the best teams are at TI. And that's kind of a weird feeling going into it. It's almost like back to like TI2 or TI3 where everything was invites, kind of like based by Valve and an ephemeral eye test that they did. Well, there, I mean, there is an element of TI where it's not just the best teams. It's True. also every region is like represented by the best teams in their region, right? True. So there is some element of that, which I do think that the system did like do well to make the legion the the, the, the it did do well to make the region uh matter because mm-hmm. in the past you had qualifiers that happened over the course of a week and you know any team can get hot or do well and then you had remember those tiebreakers for dpc seating that nobody took seriously right or true or we, we tried to take it seriously but not everybody did um so making the regions matter making the sort of leagues and stuff matter that's good and yeah i, I, I agree. think that's a step in the right direction um I think for the for the thing about whether teams are good enough or not, yeah, I just think you just need a better major format for sorting teams. Like mm-hmm. you, you should let people play as much of the field as possible, and that way, like there's benefit for everybody too. Because if you're a good team, you can survive the variance and prove that you're still the best. If you're a bad team or an experienced team, you get valuable experience on land against you know these other. So again, people always talk about. Um, the anime major because I think a lot of that is just people didn't like the outcomes that that, that happened and, mm. and to be honest their favorite teams in, but if you look you look at Singapore um, you have this fanatic team they won their region right a pretty difficult stacked region they go to the major and they play five games mm-hmm. they played they played EG and they played another team from their region which is always like kind of wonky or weird right and then and then both teams finish top six and fanatic lost to both of them and they're just out right so how confident are you at fanatics relative standing in the field of 18 teams not very I, I'd say <laughs> not, not very, very confident yeah, yeah like, like right so like they could have been a top eight team and yeah. you go you know, whatever and you just and you just wouldn't know because you know they got these two series and that was it contrast that with lgd lgd went to that tournament they played 35 games i think they played actually every single team except like fanatic or something it's like the it's actually incredible because it started from wildcard. They played everybody except one team in the entire field. And they won, they played 35 games and won like two thirds, like 23 of them. So you have an extremely high degree of confidence that LGD is like a damn good team. Like they're like one of the better teams in the world because they played so many teams and they beat so many of them. Right. And so that to me should increase in value of like how sure you you are that this team like belongs at ti or should be at ti because they just prove to you that they're better than most of the world right yep. um so these these kind of examples of variants and stuff, i think they just need to be controlled for and it's it's not it's not hard the format the, the ti format is good for a reason it exists for a reason it's good mm-hmm. uh you play a wide range of games against a large field and I think an upper bracket team has one TI every single year that it's happened. So, you know, like, yeah, that team was better than a lot of teams and they ended up being the best. Like it seems consistent. It seems fair. It's, it makes sense. So I would just love to see something in that direction for, for the majors. And I said it, I've been saying it for years. I've actually cried about formats and, and all that for years and the need for more round robin for years and years. I've said it and I still continue to believe it. I said it when a DPC came out. I didn't wait for the results this year either. I tweeted it in January, you know, like you can see it. I also pointed out back then how some of these things might not be good for some other regions, including Europe. You know, where was the outcry and support then? There's not, we, we got a, we got a no tail tweet telling us that our region was a joke. That's, that was the only public response I saw to it. Um, right. So yeah, I think that's, as far as improving DPC, I think that's the main thing that can be better. Cool. All right. Well, um, I mean, as you head into TI, are you guys doing anything in particular to, to prep for the big event? Um, obviously, you're in Ukraine. You said the guys are still at home. I assume you'll be coming together at some point uh, as we get closer to the actual event and doing a bit of a, a boot camp or something like that in Europe. Uh, but are you are you doing anything in particular? I mean, now that you guys have been to TI a couple of times, you know, in, in varying degrees of this roster, everybody has some experience playing the event and, and what it means. Uh, so is there anything you're you're trying to, like, change without giving away the secret sauce to to maybe get over that next hurdle and, and really challenge for the title? Uh, nothing, nothing outlandish. I mean, we're, we're going early to, to boot camp in uh, 
looks like we're going to do it in Romania. So mm-hmm. we're just, yeah, we just go there a couple weeks early, get adjusted, boot camp practice, like, you know, put, put to, and then, yeah, just we do our best and, you know, we expect to be able to do pretty well. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, b- before I, I let you go, and, and thank you so much for, for being here for this hour long conversation so far, uh, I kind of want to just get your your general thoughts on sort of like the, the future of Dota esports and and maybe drawing a little bit from your your love of traditional sports. Um, what what things could be done or or would you like to see come into esports to uh, to maybe elevate? the um just the general like level of competition or the the industry and how it's run that kind of stuff like where do you see esports going and where would you like to see it going uh, i mean esports in general is it's it's an inevitability just because it's as simple as you know my my generation and before my generation especially people grew up you go outside with your friends and you're you're playing sports right mm-hmm. so you grow up you playing it you watch it like you become fans, you become invested in it. But then starting with, I would say, my generation or maybe a little bit before and certainly after, you grow up playing games with your friends. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so naturally some of these games are really well made, like Dota 2, which I still consider the best game ever made. And so you have competitive scenes that come from the games that enable it and you foster them and they become a part of this uh, esports conglomerate. So I think it's there's a certain inevitability to that. It's just what people do, what people are attached to, what they find fun, and it's just it's unavoidable. Mm-hmm. Um, so esports in general, I mean, yeah, it'll continue to grow. A lot of issues and problems are unique to it and have to be sorted out, um, and have to be you know have to continue to become better, and more sort of stable and and, and, and sort of uh, professional, and and you know all the inefficiencies and problems have to be solved. Um, Dota is pretty unique dota is the way dota has been handled it's really more like tennis golf or prize fighting if you think about it and, <laughs> totally you know like that comes with sort of unique features um some are good some you know like maybe less so uh, just the level of the volatility and and inst- instability and sort of unpredictability that, that that's been inherent to that uh, you know, has been has been problematic in its own ways, but it's been very rewarding to the people who've been the absolute best. And nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. So, I I think for Dota, I maybe there is, and I just don't know about it. But I would, if I were to wish for something, I would wish for a consistently executed sort of long term plan and vision. You know, I would wish for like people to say, "This is what we what we aim to do." in in this number of years this is how we're going to get there and that will inspire confidence in in players and stuff about growth and opportunities that will inspire confidence in sponsors and people looking to enter the space and say oh okay you have a you have a direction for this instead it often just feels like it's like look you got some smart people and you come up with a good idea and people are like yeah that sounds great let's do it and then it just it just feels like this is closer to the actual process Mm -hmm. um Again, I could be totally wrong, but that just seems to me like that, that that's how it is. And um, that, like, if you find out two weeks before the season starts, like, what the season's going to be and how it's going to look, um, and, you know, and the bottom, like, if you find those things out, uh, that's not, that's not good for a sense of growth and consistency and, and sponsors and whatever. It's, it's, you know, it's just way too like wild and random. So I think that was that would be the one thing that that I would hope for. And of course, you can't plan for everything. You know, you don't know how the, which ways the wind shift and stuff. But I think for a game as good and as enduring as Dota, I think you can. If you look at, I used to play a lot of Age of Empires too when mm-hmm. I was a kid. Uh, they went through some dark times too. But look at DE is basically just a remastered version of it with some new stuff. It it grew it's doing and well. it thrived. Yeah. yeah. This this game is 25 years old at this point. Um, these 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 games, these computer games, these well made ones, like they have enduring value. Um, you know, like that you can you can make an ecosystem that's that's good if you treat if you want to treat people in the ecosystem as like sort of invested, 
you know, partners or people who are there for the long haul, you can, you can make a good ecosystem uh, off of that. So I, that's, that's what I hope for. Um, I love this game. I would, I don't think I would go into like another game. I, mm. I would just wouldn't, I just wouldn't have the, I wouldn't care about it. I wouldn't really have any sort of the passion or enthusiasm for it. And so I'd quickly be like, I'm just here, you know, cause I'm here not because I, I love it or I want to be there. So yeah, I, I want Dota to do well. Um, and I hope it has the, the framework to, to continue to, to do better. Yeah, man, that's, that's such an interesting and, and good point to make. Like, I mean, re- realistically people have been playing, baseball for over 100 years people have been playing basketball for i don't know what like 60 years something like that these sports they they probably started out fairly similar like the premier league the biggest the biggest uh global league realistically it was like a club league it started out it was just people getting together forming clubs playing playing football or soccer for us americans and now look at it so i i completely agree it's, it's really just and and somebody who i mean i i created content in dota primarily for five years basically and every single couple of months i'd be like how much longer are people going to watch dota videos you know because <laughs> we don't know whether the game's going to be good or, or whether people are going to be interested in it because there's just no structure it is very random and kind of like fly by the seat of the pants and it makes it almost like more mentally taxing to be involved than any other <laughs> game that's out there but but you are right like you know chess how long has chess been around People still play that because it's a well-made, well-organized game. So why can't that happen with a computer game? I think it it probably just takes a little bit of a paradigm shift where people are they look at games as a commodity more so than like a system still because they have been a commodity. Developer makes game, releases it on a disc. People buy disc, play game for a year, and then buy the next one or whatever. And and we are kind of in this new age of like continual patching and just really, I mean. We switched from Source 1 to Source 2 in, in, in Dota 2. So it basically became an entirely new game with new engine and everything running it. So who's to say Dota 2 can't just go to Source 3? It doesn't have to become Dota 3. It can still just be Dota 2, but with better graphics and an engine running it. There's nothing really stopping that from ever happening. So I agree, man. Um I think that's basically all I have for you. I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I just I really appreciate you spending your time and giving me some insight into kind of what it's like to manage a team. It's sort of like the reason that I wanted to make this podcast is just to have conversations with people that are involved in the space and esports and sports. And I, I hope to have sports psychologists on this show at some point because that's fascinating to me. I just want to learn from people that are doing cool stuff. Um, and so I appreciate you blessing me and the and the listeners and viewers with some knowledge what it's like to, to be involved in esports. Is there anything that you want to shout out or anything, any final topics you want to throw out there before I let you go? Um, I mean, first shout out to the people that, that have, that have helped us these last few months. Um, you know, like, like we've been able to, to give back some things, but you know, a lot of it is just, is just out of passion and out of fandom. So, you know, we're very thankful for that. We, we wouldn't be even, even where we are today, um, in the situation that we're in, uh, in some ways, without like the, their support and their assistance, like, we we wouldn't have a logo if not, you know, for for Gabriel. So, uh, th- first shout out to them, thank them, and then, you know, thanks to to the people who who support us. Again, I I uh, I've always been a sucker for sort of, you know, social media to some extent and Reddit and stuff. I see people out there, you know, with the with the flares and like. Defending the stuff is nice. It's it, it, you know, each everyone counts. So, thank you and uh, thank you for doing this podcast. Very very thoughtful and very you know, well organized. It's, it's it's been fun and uh, you know we're gonna try to make everybody proud at uh, TI. We're gonna we're gonna do our best. Um, and again, I think we can do pretty well. So, go ahead, keep keep predicting that. You know, we're gonna be the go for it. Like we let's get in line. There's nothing we haven't heard already. So. You know, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we're we're going to do us. And yeah, we're going to we're going to prove people wrong. All right. Yeah. Talk your shit, Jack. That's awesome. I, I appreciate it. Thanks again for joining me. Um, and best of luck at TI. I'm, I'm really excited to see how you guys do 
And um, yeah, if there's anything, I, I'll send you some book recommendations and, and stuff once we're done with the conversation. So yes, yes, please do. Please do. Thank you. Thank Perfect. you so much. Perfect. All right. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching.